Who here? Android, iPhone, Sidekick, Motorola Razor. I'm not here to judge. But who here has a camera phone? Cool, cool. So virtually everybody in this room has a camera phone. So this exemplifies how photography, video, and you know, just, just the visual arts have been democratized. And due to this, it was how I was introduced at my local skate park, where I would just um, film my friends doing tricks they'd ask me, and I, I turned out to be just a go-to guy to ask for a video, because I just did it all the time. And film my friends doing all these tricks and lines. And I was like, okay, I'm doing this all the time, so I might as well get good at it. So I did my homework, and you know, through the internet, I just learned about video and composition and programs, but that's for another talk, there's a lot of stuff. And with, with my, my iPhone 4 and all of its 720p glory, and you guys are looking like this like it's an artifact, because it is. <laughs> so, um, and with it, I actually made a, a, my first and last special effects video. So, I always said how photography was for cornballs. I was like, oh, in video, you know, you master all these frames. And with photography, I'm like, okay, you know, you only master like one frame. Like, okay, how, how much more easier can it get? And ironically enough, I grew so enthusiastic about video, I burned out my computer. And that's why I said this was my last one, because I just couldn't do video anymore. And like, when I turned on my computer, I was like, and like, and like, my mom wasn't too hyped on it too. So I got, I got a, um, a, a lower, a lower version computer, it's cheaper, and I was forced to go into photography when I was talking about how it was like <laughs> so easy and for cornballs, and um, then I, I began doing composites, because um, the special effects thing I did back then with video influenced me to um, play with Photoshop. And here's some examples of what I did. That's at the skate park, my friend Gaki. I haven't seen them in a long time, I don't know what's going with him, but um, this is him doing a melon and a little thing. That's over here at the basketball courts, um, outside of, by the parking lot. Um, and like the lights right there, that's, that was edited, and um, the reflections at the bottom, that's done in Photoshop. And you see how both sides of the parking lot are also reflected, so the lights like, are like, you know, there's symmetry to it. And um, this is taken in New York, where um, I got buildings from different corners that stood out to me. And I just put them together like that, and you know, I put a bird in the middle because it's poetic and deep. So, uh, yeah. And the clouds in the back are photoshopped too, from a different photo I took another day. And um, this is my friend Ian. We were over in Jersey by the, the mountains up north. And um, the only original part of this photo was, was um, there was some trees at the top which you can't see, it was too dark, and the light, that's it. And like the fog, the street, like the smoke, even my friend was photoshopped in. So, I don't know, I saw Photoshop as kind of like a, a brush, like, in, in, like digitally, where I expressed myself that way, and then it was like, you know, my brush and stuff. I started to feel restricted, um, shooting with iPhone, and I was like, okay, you know, I felt like I did everything I could with this. I, don't, I keep doing the same stuff with the orange clouds and, and whatever. And a lot, of my, a, lot, a lot of my friends that I have now told me, yo, whatever you did with the, with the orange stuff, man, I did not feel it. And like, <laughs> they would always tell me it was terrible. So it was very polarizing. Some people liked it, some people didn't. Um, and so I felt restricted, and every, every winter I would go shoveling. But in, instead of spending it on, on, on things that weren't much use to me, I spent the money on a camera. I got off a of Craigslist listing. And matter of fact, I got the camera for 70% off its original price. Someone was just trying to get rid of it. It was in mint condition. And you know, another man's trash is another man's treasure. Yeah, that was never more true. So I was so hyped when I got this. And with the camera, that's the first thing I did with it. I went down and I took a picture of uh, the Warm World Trade Center. I took a picture of clouds. And um, the stars on top are photoshopped in. And then like the meteors, because you know, poetry was photoshopped in. And you know, it was like, you know, put on a cloud, whatever. It wasn't much meaning to it. I just did it because I thought it looked cool. And I began taking, with the camera, I stopped doing composites because I had more freedom with the DSLR to do different things. So I began taking pictures of what I call my eye and just more buildings and, and street shots and all that, like scenic stuff. And I've heard the word, see, the thing is, it's like, I've heard the word street photography been thrown around 
in forums and through my friends, but I never really knew what it was. I had a very elementary understanding of it where I thought it was just, you know, those scenic shots and those drive-by shots of people just walking and I was like, oh, okay, street photography, you know, you take a picture of like, you know, the asphalt, like, you know, street photography. But um, then I came across this documentary called, by Cheryl Dunn called Everybody Street. And just like these A Day in the Life videos I watched when I was a kid of my favorite skateboarders, um, this was the same thing, but just street photographers from classic New York street photographers, just a day in the life and what they did to take photos. And when I saw this, you know, I was like, whoa, like these guys would burst personal bubbles out on the street, whoever caught their eye, and they would even build relationships with these people and even become friends. And I saw that and I was like, whoa, like this is for me. And I, when I was exposed to that, because there was this freedom to it, just like with skateboarding, and you know, you could go down whatever street, and you know, you, you, a stair set, you won't look at it the same way. You won't see a handrail the same way. You start thinking what you could do with that. You, you start thinking what you could do on a ledge. And you know, there's skate, skateboarding parts where there's just people like skating rocks <laughs> and uh, like logs and all that stuff. And it's just so, it, there's this freedom to it, and you, you could do whatever you want with it. That's why I don't think it's really a sport. It's more of an expression. Because with the sport, you know, you're limited to a field or, or a court or a hoop or whatever. But with skateboarding, man, like I said, you could skate the tree if you want to. It doesn't really matter. And you could go wherever you want with it. And with street photography, it felt the same way because I could go down any street, and I never looked at people the same way after that. I, like, I would turn a blind eye to people, and I really wouldn't, like, care. But, like, people started to catch my attention. And, um... So I took that picture with my 85 millimeter, and it was, that was all manual focus, so that's why I was so proud of that shot, because I, I got it like pin sharp, and it was like on a wide aperture, so it was like you have like this much freedom to get it sharp. And just the lighting and all that, I just felt so much, but away from the scenic shots, I started to interact with people. And this guy on the left, um, uh, it, I met him, after the A train broke down, we were stuck in a tunnel, and the A train is known for like pulling like all this weird stuff, and the A train is always breaking down. So I met with him, and I hung out for the day, and I took this picture of him. It was it's flipped actually upside down, so you can see it better. And this guy on the on the right, definitely a character. Even though he's in New York, um, that's all like a uh, crazy stallion. This is like a beer stash he has from the cops, and um, I was talking from he's from he's from uh, he's from Ecuador, and. I was like, oh, so he was talking about history and stuff. I'm like, oh, you don't have family around here? He's like, no, I do. And I was like, so, like, what's good with them? And he's like, oh, you know, they're over in New Jersey. I'm like, so, you have a place to stay? He's like, oh, yeah, I do. So I'm like, why aren't you there? He's like, oh, I don't, I don't like New Jersey. <laughs> so he, he prefers to, um, to be over here just chilling with these crazy stallions and stuff. His name's Juan, by the way. Um, and, well, I mean, he has, like, a million-dollar view of the Brooklyn Bridge. So, you know, he's winning, kind of. So, um... And yeah, I always see, if you ever go by there under the FDR, you always see him and say, I said, what's up? So this one time, I, I was going down this alleyway, just, you know, looking around. And I, my camera was on the side, all my equipment was out. I had like a big book pack. And I saw this guy with the hood coming up behind me. I was like, yo, I'm really about to get robbed right now. So I'm like, okay, what can I do? I can't, it's either I run out here or, you know, I take up this opportunity. So I was like, all right, all right. I turned around, I was like, yo, what's up, man? He was like, oh, what's going on? And I was like, yo, what you doing around here, man? What's good, what's good? And um, he, and then we were talking and stuff. And here's the thing about photography, it's kind of like, like um, I've said before, like a, a social passport, where this camera kind of gives you, gives you this reason to talk to people. And just, it's, 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 like, it's like a portal, I guess, to like, go to people, it's like, yo, like, I'm not just going up to, you know, I have a camera, so it's like, but, um, so it, it's, yeah, it's kind of like a social passport, and, I, and like, you learn, it's, it's not just, you know, taking the picture and composition and shutter speed, aperture, ISO, and, you know, AI servo, AI fo and all that stuff, and keeping that in mind, and you have to be so quick with it, because you're not in a studio, you're out on the street, and these moments happen like that, but then you also have to know how to interact with people and not, you know, take them off. Because this one time when I started out and I didn't know much about street photography, you know, I would, I would, I would have a zoom lens and it felt very weird just because I, I tried being stealthy and hiding from my subjects and it, it felt very odd. And hiding from my subjects all the time and not interacting with them with, at all looking back, it is odd that one time I was, this woman was, was running and, and I was taking pictures of her and then she saw me. 
she came to me and she's like, what are you doing? This, that, this, that. She thought I was a pervert. And <laughs> I was like, yo, like, I, you know, I'm, and she didn't let me talk. She threatened to rape my camera. Thankfully, I stole my camera. And so that's that. But then when I go up to people with my wide angle, real close, like up to here, and with my flash, sometimes off camera flash, and you know, I, I know how to talk to them, you know, I compliment them or whatever, and they leave with a smile. So you wouldn't think bursting people from people's bubbles would, you know, would be welcoming, but you know, I found out a way. So um, you learn how to interact with people. So anyway, I was talking with the dude, and um, he knocks on this cage. He was like, yo, D, yo, D, yo, D. And then this dude, you know, you, you hear like these chains unlock, whatever, and then he opens the door, he was like, yo, what's up? Was, and um, he, he wanted to buy a cigarette. I don't condone smoking, but I was like, yo, yeah, I'll buy you the cigarette, whatever, trying to get cool with him. So I had my D4 on. But um, I bought him the cigarette, it was a Lucy. And then I, I started talking with them, I got cool with them. And eventually, they, I built this relationship with them where they invited me in to this spot they had. And it was, it, so it's all covered by, by like scrap metal. And that's where they stay. And um, this was them. And uh, yeah, was, I got like over 1,500 photos from there just that day, like those four hours hanging out with them. And um, we went we went to Chinatown, and then I went with them to get Lucy's, and then learned like how these like so you think oh these guys spend like all this money on cigarettes where like they find methods to like get 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 their vices like at cheap prices. So you go into like a bodega. We we went to this worn down bodega, and um, he went in and, and like this little kid behind the counter, just running a bodega in 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 New York like no problem. And um and he goes up to him and is like yo kid and is like can I get a laffy taffy? I'm like we came all this way for laffy taffies. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and then this kid pulls out a bunch of loose cigarettes, and they're like, what, 50 cents a pop and stuff. So that was, and I was like, whoa. So like, you, you, you learn about these lives and you document these lives. And matter of fact, I went to go visit them. Um, I went to go visit them Saturday. And that place where they stayed isn't there anymore. It, it got knocked down, all this stuff got, got um, thrown out. And when they came back, it wasn't there. So they had to start all over. So document these, these moments and these people, it's, it, you think you have all the time in the world, but then like you know, I learned I was like, all right, it's gone. So like those photos I have, like that's that. And now they sleep, they're sleeping on benches again. And I volunteer on weekends at this uh, hardcore place, hardcore punk venue. And it's a dude um, with his girlfriend and his daughter. And the thing about I'm in, I'm into a lot of types of music. You know, ask my mom. I'm always in my bedroom listening to jazz, R&B, soul, uh, old school hip hop, all that stuff. But Hardcore music, especially, where it's not something you could find like you know, on the radio or whatever. You're never gonna find it on the radio. Um, and just like how I was frustrated, how I didn't find about Street Fighter until so late, because with hardcore music, you, you know, I found it until way later in my life. And you know, I was listening to Jonas Brothers way back then when I was like eight and stuff. That was like my thing. Um, and when I found hardcore music, you you think, oh, it's all these dudes screaming to a mic and stuff, but there's like this positivity into it where, um, and it's like a language where you start, you don't need to start reading the lyrics and stuff, you could like understand it, what they're saying, and the suit just screaming to the mic. But um, punk rock laid the foundation for hardcore, where punk rock was more about um, complaining about things and just, you know, a, a big middle finger to the whole world and whatever, like, you know, country music was whack, so that's why they made punk rock, and New Wave, New wave was whack, so that's why they made punk rock. And Blondie, New Wave, was actually, um, she did punk first, she was at CG, CBGB's. Um, and where hardcore was about finding answers to those problems, finding solutions to those problems. Whereas in hardcore, there's this, there's this spirituality to it and this individuality, just like with skateboarding, and this individuality I find with, with street photography, and this individuality I find in the people I shoot and that attract me. With with hardcore, there's this like bad brains where where Rastafarian they're about this this because they played they were known to be one of the most influential um, hardcore bands. They played fast and they played good because when you play fast, you're just hiding that you can't play. But they actually played fast and they sounded good. And they they talked about spirituality, but they also played reggae too. So like there'd be this intermission where they played reggae and these guys who were just at one minute punching each other and stuff like are not like chilling. And and so this individuality to it, and where hardcore even coined terms like like street edge, um, minor threat coined street edge, where it was abstainment from alcohol, abstainment from drugs, and abstainment from promiscuous sex. And when I found hardcore music, and when I when I found bands like that, 
I was yeah, I identified with it. I was like, well, like there's people out out there like me. And when I went to these shows and I talked to these people, and just take it even to to new heights, like when lead singer of Crow Mags and Youth of Today, where um, I took it to heights where abstainment from from meat, poultry, you know, uh, grain, all that stuff. Because there's this thing about about self control, and and treating your body as a temple. And and having that 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 self like willpower, so they create all this stuff and built this community on it. And I remember this one time in in this, in, in the place I volunteer at, I was with um, you know, I was, we were listening to this band. And during and during an intermission, I was just talking to this guy on, to the left of me. He was he was from the military, and we were talking and stuff. But then when the drum hit, we both looked at each other, we nodded our heads, and then we pushed each other and started a mosh pit all around us. And then. So it, with people you don't know, but you feel this connection because you're both acting, listening to the same music, you're both listening to the same lyrics, you both support all these ideas, and uh, about being yourself and this, and you know just doing what you want to do, you know, and 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 just I'm I'm saying that individuality, um, and that's why hardcore music has influenced my work too, where where I find these people and when I'm out on the street, I I sort of find myself where the people who 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 attract me, it's the people who exude like a bit of my personality. I'm like, oh, I see a little bit of myself in that, in that person, whether they're crazy or whether they're big fashion heads or whatever. I see a little bit of me in them, and then when I talk to them, you, I'm totally right. Cause, and that's, that's how I express myself, because through these people, I, I see myself and I find myself on the streets and learn more about myself, and it's, it's practically like, like my friends out there. And if, if I leave you with anything, it's no matter what you do, anything you do, you don't try to to do it better or idolize someone, or just do your own thing. You know, you learn from the classics, you learn from the basics, but you, you're gonna put your, your flavor to it, your style with skateboarding. You learn your ollie, you learn your kickflip, your, your backside 180s, frontside 180s. But once you learn all that and you got it down, like that's when you put your flavor to it. I could watch silhouettes of all these all these um, professional skateboarders. And you watch the silhouette, the shadows, but you know who's skating because of how they, of how they execute the tricks and what tricks they, they do. You have the tools too. You know, me, some kid from the skate park, somehow got his hands on an iPhone going to a DSLR and doing all this stuff. So the resources are out there and, and, and the, the progress will catch you off guard looking back at whatever, whatever you did back then. You'll be like, whoa, like that was me, like I did that, you know, like I, I was photoshopping orange clouds and, and being poetic and with the birds and stuff, like that was me. But um, you know, taking pride in it, cause then that put me to where I am now, and you know, I'm I'm still progressing, cause just these few photos I showed you, you know, um, it's going out there. It's therapeutic to me, and whatever you do, if you find that therapy in it, because I've I've taken, you know, I cure my headaches like this too. And I'm like, oh, you know, I have a headache. I've been inside too long. I'm going on the street, and that's why I have like over 16,500 photos in my library unedited, and some of my favorite photos are already selected. So, in whatever you do, persevere. With that perseverance, like I find in hardcore music, and even writing this talk, I never realized the um, all, all these cultures I'm involved in and how they inspired me. I mean, so reflecting upon what inspires you in your background is, is really important. And you almost certainly have an iPhone in your pocket. So thank you.